for those of you who have joined <coughs> um, since I started talking, there is a quiz available. It's available till Friday at midnight. It's three questions. It's worth five points and it's extra credit, which means it'll fill in for any quizzes you may have missed. Um, the first question is, did you turn in your ILAB? I need you to let me know if you got it in because I need to let them know how many people still need to turn it in. Um, we really don't wanna charge anybody for not having their IL labs in or have an issue there. Um, you turn it into lot six at the main campus between eight and four this week. The second question is a question on buoyancy on an object floating in the water. Um, that's covered in, um, it, there's a homework problem that we're gonna talk about today about it. Um, and then the third problem is an oscillation, writing the equation. And um, we'll talk about those on Thursday, but treat these like practice final problems and just see if you can do them um, and do your best. Okay, so on to our review. As I said, um, the final covers four problems from 13, 14, and 15. Um, we already talked about gravity once. I'm going to talk about it again later, but today I'm going to cover 13 and 14, those homeworks and the problems on fluids and gravity in the practice exams that I give. So um, I'm really going to try and, and concentrate on concepts and equations. You kind of need to make sure you know going into the final. Um, so here's the thing. Um, fluids. We basically, the number one thing that I need you to know um, is really Bernoulli's equation and then buoyancy. Uh, so two things. Um, there's an additional thing that we'll talk about in a minute, but for Bernoulli's equation, and I'm sure I'm spelling this wrong, but Bernoulli's equation is the one that says pressure one plus the density of the fluid times the velocity squared over two plus the density times G times height one is equal to some other point, the pressure, the density times the velocity squared plus rho G H two. And you can remember this because it's essentially like the um, energy equation that we had way back in chapter seven. Um, remember, this is a static pressure, this is a kinetic pressure, and this is a gravitational pressure. This leads to, if there's no kinetic change, and we'll talk about why there wouldn't be, P1 plus rho G H1 is equal to P2 plus rho G H2. And if I say that P2 is the final pressure, then P2 is P1 plus rho G H1 minus H2, where H is defined positive upward. Um, that was the first equation we had in fluids. So you really only need to remember Bernoulli's without velocity to do like air pressure change as you go up or water pressure change when you go down. There's the continuity equation which says the velocity times the cross-sectional area is equal to the velocity times the cross-sectional area at another point anywhere. That's from incompressible fluids. But practically what that lets you do is it lets you substitute for V1 an equation that has V2 so that you eliminate a variable in Bernoulli's equation. Um, and the last thing that I'll say is sometimes P2 minus P1 is written as delta P. And delta P is then equal to rho G delta H with a negative sign where Delta H is H2 minus H1. So we'll see that in the homework. Um, the only other equation that you really needed to remember was that in Pascal's equation for a hydraulic pump, the pressure is always the same. So pressure is force over area. And so you have this equation, which is Pascal. That only applies to an incompressible fluid with one entry and one exit in a volume container that the volume can't change. And we have a problem on that, so we'll talk more about that. But really that's all you need for, um, you need this one 
and you need to know Bernoulli's equation to do fluids. Um, and you need to understand them, obviously. So as we go through this homework, hopefully that'll make sense to you. So here we're told that we want to calculate the hydrostatic difference in blood pressure between the brain and the foot of a person with a certain height. And they give us the density of blood. So most of the fluid problems just start off by writing Bernoulli's equation. Um, and remember, like I said, this is a lot like the, um, if you remember the energy equation, then you can think of it as a pressure equation that looks like the energy equation. In the energy equation, we had mv squared over two plus mgh plus kx squared over two at different points. Well, here the pressure is conserved. So we write the pressure, the static, the kinetic and the gravitational pressure at each point. Now, what are our points here? Well, our points are a person and H2 and H1 will be um, the brain and then the foot. Um, actually, let me do this because the way I read the question is it's down. So H1, if we assume H is positive upward, is 1.78 and H2 is zero. Now, this is assuming that there's no volume change. Remember that V1, A1 is equal to V2, A2. So the area didn't change. And if the area doesn't change, then the velocity doesn't change. And these go away. And so what we're given is that P1 plus rho G H1 is equal to P2 plus rho G H2. They want the, the hydrostatic difference. What they're saying is what is the change between P2 minus P1? Okay, and that is rho g h2 minus h1. And they told us that the blood has a density of 1060. G, we can use 9.8. H2, we said was zero. And h1 is 1.78. Um, here though, it's one of those things where um, Basically, Wiley's asking for the magnitude, I'm guessing. Um, that should really be between the foot and the brain because the foot will have a higher pressure than the brain. Um, or did I mess something up? Let me make sure I didn't. Oh, I see what I did. I'm, I'm the one that's wrong. P2 minus P1 is H1 minus H2. So I'm being dumb. Um, Sorry guys. And as you'll see, it's always a negative sign that confuses things. H1 is 1.78, H2 is zero, so we get 1.78. And when you put these numbers in, you'll get 18490.64 Pascals. Um, one thing I should note is that there are 1010000 Pascals is equal to one atmosphere and 14.7 PSI is equal to one atmosphere. And at sea level, the pressure is one atmosphere. Those things you have to know um, in order to do fluids. The other thing that you might need to know is the density of water is 1000 kilograms per meter cubed. So um, that's just background stuff you really should know. Um, so back to this, all we did, well, we, we wrote Bernoulli's equation and we made sure that we had our heights, the signs correct. Um, and then I, unfortunately, when I wrote P2 minus P1, I didn't do the algebra. And if I'd done the algebra, I would have realized I had the H's backwards. Um, so that is how you do that one. You could have looked at the book and the book would have said P is equal to P naught um, minus rho G H two minus H one. And then realize that Delta P is P minus P naught 
And this with the negative sign is rho G H1 minus H2. But I think it's better to use Bernoulli's equation and realize there's no change in area. Therefore, there's no change in velocity and the velocity cancel. That way you only have to remember one equation and you don't have to remember a bunch of signs. Uh, as long as you get H positive upward. Why is H positive upward? Because we're dealing with gravity and gravity increases um, the pressure as it drops, you know? Okay. So this one is quite literally the last, the same thing that we just did. Um, so let's write, we want, if you read through this, we want to know the pressure difference um, of the lungs when we go down. So P2 minus P1, which is our delta P, is rho G H1 minus H2 again. And here the signs have to be important. Notice that the density is the density of water because the pressure on the lungs when it's in the water is due to the water. Um, even though the lungs are full of air, the pressure needs to be the pressure of, um, or the density of water. Um, so first we say that we have a snorkel tube. So for the snorkel, H1 is zero, H2 is negative 0 0.30, 30 centimeters or 0.3 meters. For the second one, the elephant's lungs, H1 is zero, H2 is negative 4.7. The negative signs are really important. Um, so the last thing that they want is because this is Wiley, they want it in atmospheres. I mean, I, I don't know, maybe you can change that to, to Pascal's, but if they want it in atmospheres, we're going to need to take the pressure and divide it by 101000 Pascal's per atmosphere to get these decimals. But you can see for this one, delta P is density of water times G times H1, so zero minus a minus, 0 0.3. This is 1000, this is 9.8, so this is 9800 times 0.3, all divided by 101.00, and you'll get 0.029. Same here, um, delta P is rho G 1000 times 9.8 times 0 minus a minus, so 4.7 meters and divide that by 101.000 to get it in atmospheres. And again, you'll get 0.455. Um, so um, as an aside, almost half an atmosphere is pretty harsh. Um, we talked about that, that if you've ever gone swimming, swim to the deep end and go all the way down to the bottom, you'll feel it on your ears. That's what this problem is trying to show you is the pressure at 14 feet below the water level is actually pretty high, which is a little weird. All right, enough of that. This is Pascal. And Pascal, you have to have an enclosed, rigid volume. So the volume can't change when you use Pascal's. And what that says is P is same everywhere. That's really important. Um, and if P is the same everywhere and P is equal to force over area, then what we can do is we can write F1 over A1 is equal to F2 over A2. And they tell us here that F2 is 7.1 kilonewtons. So 17,100 newtons and they give us the diameters. Now the area is going to be a circle with a diameter of the given. Area of a disc is pi r squared. Since r is equal to half of d, this is pi d squared over four. So r becomes d to the half squared, you get d squared over four. This to find F1 is simply A1 over A2 times F2. A1 and A2 are pi 
d1 squared over uh, 4 over pi d2 squared over 4 times f2. The pi over 4 cancels. d1, remember that you're in centimeters. You can leave them in centimeters, though. So this is really 3.63 squared over 67 squared times 17,100. Um, the reason why you can leave them in centimeters is you're dividing them. And as long as they have the same units, you don't have to turn it into meters if you don't want to. It's fine. Um, that will give you about 50. Um, what the answer is, I'm not going to run that. But really, the big part of Pascal's that I want you to remember that if Pascal shows up on the final, is it only applies when you have an enclosed rigid volume. So the volume cannot change. And when that's true, the pressure everywhere is the same. The pressure in and the pressure out are the same. And the pressure is force over area. Um, so that's not too bad, I don't think. This is a problem that's much like the practice quiz. You have a block of wood that is floating in water. Um, so floating in some water, right? And this whole block of wood has a volume that's length times width times height. The submerged portion has a volume. So I'll put volume of object. And the volume in the water is L, W, H, where this is little H, this is H. And what we need to find is we need to find the density of this wood and the density of oil if it's an oil. So for the water part, um, we're told that the volume in the water is equal to 0.61 of the volume um, of the object. Okay. And if it's floating, let's go back to this. The buoyant force on a um, free body diagram and the weight, and then you have A. But here we would have MA is buoyant force minus MG, but because it's floating, it's static. And that means that the acceleration is zero. That means that our buoyant force is MG. And our buoyant force, according to Archimedes, was the mass of the water times G. And the mass of the water is the density of water times the volume in the water, the volume that's submerged times G. So what we have is we have the density of water times the volume in the water times G is equal to the density of the object times the volume of the object times G because mg is the density of the object times the volume of the object times g. The g's obviously cancel, and we get that the density of the object is going to be density of the water, 1,000, times the volume in the water, divided by the total volume of the object. Now, the water has a volume of 0.61 of the object. So this is 0.61 v of object, v of object cancel, and we get 1,000 times 0.61 or 610, obviously, kilograms per meter cubed. Now that we know that, OK, um, now that we know the density of the object, when it's in oil, right, it's the same exact equation, but things change. And now, in the oil, the density of the oil times the volume in the oil times g is equal to the density of the object times the volume of the object times g. G's cancel. We're told that the, sorry, we're told that 0.86% of the volume is submerged. So um, volume in the oil is 0 0.86 um, volume of the object. The g cancel. Density of the oil is therefore density of the object times V of the object over V in the oil. And this, we said that the density was, sorry, 610. So this is 610. 
the volume of the object over V of oil, this is 0 0.86 V of object and V of object, those obviously cancel. So you get 610 divided by 0 0.86, which is about a thousand, uh, sorry, 709. Um, if you run it through your calculator, to be safe, I will do that to make sure I didn't do anything weird. Yeah, 709.3. Um, so you can see that these are um, essentially, the physics here is this, that when it's floating, it's static, the buoyant force is equal to the mass of the water and density is equal to mass over volume. So mass is density times volume. You have to be careful though, because the amount of water displaced is only a fraction of the volume usually, unless the object completely submerged. Um, so usually you get it as a fraction. In the quiz problem, you're actually going to have to turn the volume into the length with height in water. And for the object, it's length times width times the total height of the object. And that way you can eliminate L and W and then you're just comparing the H's. I think that's pretty straightforward. I don't think it's too bad. I believe there's a question in your book, a practice problem that does it as well. Um, here's an identical problem. Again, MA is equal to buoyant force minus MG. If it's static, this is a floating iceberg, it's zero. So FB is MG, but this is mass of water times G is equal to mass of object times G or density of water, volume of um, the object in the water, which I'm just gonna call VW. Um, density of the object, volume of the object total times G. Now, for an iceberg, we're told that the density of the iceberg is 917 kilograms per meter cubed. And we wanna know how much would be visible. This problem is a little hard um, because imagine you have this iceberg, right? And we wanna know um, what fraction is visible. So this whole thing is the volume. And then we want to subtract off the portion that is under the water, okay, times that. So really what you're going to do is you're going to subtract it from one, and you'll see that in a second. For now, let's just find out how much is under the water. Um, v in the water is equal to the density of the object over the density of the water times the volume of the object. And we're gonna leave this alone for a minute. Actually, what we're gonna do is let's divide by V of the object and get rid of it on that side. So the fraction that's in the water is the fraction of the densities. And here, that would be 917, the density of ice over a thousand, or so 91.7% is under the water. And did I do that right? So the object, yeah. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is salt water to begin with. So this is 1024. Um, so that fraction is 917 divided by 1024 is 89.55%. But they're asking us how much of that is visible. This is how much is submerged. So one minus 0 0.8955, this will give us how much is visible. And that's obviously 10.05% or whatever that is. Um, they didn't put it as a percent, they put it as a ratio and that's fine. Now. Um, if instead we're in fresh water, we would have the same thing, but we'd have 917 over a thousand. And again, um, 917 divided by a thousand 
is 91.7%. If I subtract that from 100% minus 91.7%, I get 8.3% or 0.0083. Not too hard. Um, it's really just making sure that you understand that this is Archimedes buoyancy equation for, um, for static buoyancy when the object's not rising or falling. Um, we'll have one that uh, actually does have an acceleration on the practice final that I'll talk about. Now, um, this question is a little strange. Um, and really, it's, I said to use Bernoulli's equation, but really we want to use the continuity equation, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but generally you start with Bernoulli's equation and then you use the continuity equation. And the continuity equation says that V1 times the cross-sectional area of one is V2 times the cross-sectional area of two. Um, here, we don't need Bernoulli's equation. Here, what we're told is that we have a hose and this hose goes to a sprinkler and the sprinkler has a bunch of little holes. Basically what goes in has to come out, which is what this is saying. Um, if you look at these units, volume is meters cubed. This is meters squared. So mass in, mass out. We need to figure out what VA is here and what VA is here. And then from that, find V2. Um, the only trick here is that A1, we're going to assume is pi R1 squared or pi D1 squared over 4. And then what is A2? Well, A2, there are 24 little holes that are also round. Okay or 24 pi d2 squared um, over four. So there are 24 of these. Don't cancel anything yet. Um, we want v2, and since these two things are equal, v2 is a1 v1 over a2. a1 is pi times d1 squared over four. A2 is 24 pi D2 squared over four, and V1 is, well, V1. This all cancels the pi force, pi force. So what you get is D1 squared over 24 times D2 squared times V1, or D1, you can, again, leave them as centimeters. You don't have to convert them because as long as D1 and D2 are in the same units, everything's cool. So we get 3.7 squared over 24 times 0.34 squared times 0.92, which was the velocity. Um, when I do that, 3.7 times 3.7 divided by 24 times 0.34 times 0.34, all times 0.92, and I get 4.539648 meters per second. Um, and think about this. This is something that is kind of important that I want you to remember for the rest of your lives. Um, here, the only thing that's changing is the velocities. There's no height change. So the pressure is changing. Now, pressure one, well, let's do pressure two. Pressure two minus pressure one is equal to rho v1 squared over 2 minus rho v2 squared over 2. And we see here that v2 is much faster than v1. The water is coming out really fast. And you might think from experience that this means um, um, that the pressure increased. Um, What happened is the kinetic pressure um, actually increased, but because the kinetic pressure increased, the static pressure dropped. Um, in fact, what's going to happen is the pressure outside is going to be zero. So anytime you're open to air, the pressure becomes air, right? 
So really this change of pressure would be P2 will have to be atmosphere and you'll get a negative pressure change in order for the velocity to increase. The static pressure will change. That is a very hard thing to wrap your head around because you're used to when you close the nozzle of a water hose, the water speeds up, right? So you feel like you have more pressure. Well, that pressure is the kinetic pressure gets greater. The water has more kinetic energy because it has to leave the hose faster because water is incompressible. The same amount of water needs to pass by here that passes by here, but the openings are smaller, so the water has to pass by it faster. That raises the kinetic energy of the water, um, but it actually drops the static pressure of the water, which is a very weird idea. But anyway, to answer this question, you only needed to use this, and the trick, this is called the continuity equation, and the trick here was to find the total cross-sectional area when you have 24 holes instead of one hose. Um, so I hope that makes sense. All right, now we get to Bernoulli's equation and um, the continuity equation being used together. You just write this and then you have to figure out what is H1, what is H2, what is V1, um, what is V2, and what are P1 and what are P2. So here, P1, P2, H1, H2, V1, V2, and you have V1, A1 is V2, A2. So if there's a change in diameter of the pipe, you're going to get a difference in velocity. If the pipe doesn't change in diameter, then those terms go away that have the velocity because they cancel on both sides. So we're told that water has a speed of 4.7 meters. So V1 is going to be 4.7 meters per second with a cross-sectional area of three point, and I would actually write this too, um, 3.6 centimeters squared. The water gradually descends. So that means that let's say that H1 is always zero. If it descends, H2 will be minus, uh, minus 9.7 meters. And the pipe increases in cross-sectional area to 9.5 centimeters squared. What is the speed at the lower level? So we want V2. And if the pressure at the upper level is 1.4, what is the pressure at the lower level? So P1 will be 1.4 times 10 to the fifth Pascals and we're going to want P2. But this does really nicely. Wiley asks us the most important question first. We need to find V2 anyway. We know that V2 is V1 A1 over A2. We were given that V1 was 4.7. We're given that this is 3.6 and that this is 9.5. We can see that this is going to be smaller than V1. It's 3.6 divided by 9.5 times V1. Um, if I do that really fast in my calculator, 3.6 divided by 9.5 times uh, 4.7, and I get 1.78 um, meters per second. So notice the velocity only depends on whether the pipe got bigger or smaller. And if it didn't change in cross-sectional area, it stayed the same. So we know V2. Once we know V2, we can solve this for P2. So P2 is going to be equal to P1 plus rho G H1 minus H2 plus rho over two V1 squared minus V2 squared. And here we can just plug things in, remembering that rho is water, so it's a thousand kilograms per meter cubed. P1 we were given as 1.4 times 10 to the fifth, 1,000 times 9.8, this is zero minus a minus. So this is plus 9.7. Um, so this is 9,800 times 9.7. This is 1,000 divided by two is 500 times 4.7 squared minus 1.78 squared. And if we do all that, we'll get this number. 
um, and P1 was one, uh, four, zero, 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 zero Pascals. Everything here will be in Pascals if we're in um, kilograms per meter cubed for density, H is in meters, and V is in meters per second. Um, but yeah, so essentially, way back when we first started this class, I tried to teach you guys to write down your variables for things like free fall. These problems are exactly the same. You just really write Bernoulli's equation and the continuity equation, so this one and this one, and then get your um, variables. The only other wrinkle here is that if the pipe were open at P2, you would know that P2 had to be one atmosphere. Um, so you could change this and say, well, what if we didn't know this P1, but we knew it was open to the atmosphere at P2? Because it's open to the atmosphere, the pressure at P2 is whatever that, that atmospheric pressure is. Okay. Um, and you see that in the, the problem, the sample problem in the book with the big water tank. Um, here, again, we have a liquid with some weird density flowing through a horizontal pipe with a cross-sectional area of flaw at A and a different cross-sectional area at P at B. We're told the pressure difference between the two as a number. And then we want the volume flow rate and the mass flow rate. And that's a little weird. So here, just to start off, we write Bernoulli's equation every time. Um, and we write the continuity equation every time, which is V1, A1 is V2, A2. Now, this volume flow rate, that is NEVA, is your um, volume flow rate. V times A, so either V1A1 or V2A2. Um, and that's what they want us to find. Now, in order to find that, though, um, we're going to need to find either V1 or V2. OK, so we P1, P2, and I'm going to come back to that in a second, H1, H2, V1, V2, and A1, A2. Now, we weren't given P1, P2. We were given delta P, which is P2 minus P1. So P2 minus P1 is delta P here. That would be rho G H1 minus H2 plus rho over 2 V1 squared minus V2 squared. All I did was I moved P1 over and I moved these two terms to the other side. So looking at this, um, it's a horizontal pipe. There's no change in height, so that goes away. Secondly, we can see that V2 is equal to V1 A1 over A2, and that gives us that delta P is rho over 2 times V1 squared minus V2 squared, which is V1 squared times A1 over A2 squared. Or if you want to rewrite that, delta P is density over 2 times V1 squared times 1 minus A1 over A2 squared. Um, you can solve this for V1 pretty easily. I'll do it down here. V1 squared is equal to um, delta P divided by rho divided by 2 times 1 minus A1 over A2 squared. Um, once you do that, you can take the square root and get V1. Once you have V1, just multiply V1 times A1 or VA times AA, um, and you'll get this volume flow rate. However, the volume flow rate is VA, and we want the mass flow rate. So volume is equal to um, mass, density is mass over volume, so volume is mass divided by density. So mass divided by density times A gives you the mass flow rate. 
This would be kilograms times meters cubed divided by, uh, ooh, does it, um, sorry. I think I actually just want to multiply by the density. Um, let me check that really fast. Um, if I take the volume flow rate 0 0.079 times 960, yeah. Um, so sorry. This is the volume flow rate. Or, I don't know why my pen decided it doesn't want to work. Because weird. So the fall, volume flow rate is V times A. V is meters per second. A is, um, I'm sorry, V is not meters per second. V is meters cubed, it's volume. Um, Cross-sectional area is, um, I'm being dumb. Sorry, my brain just locked up. This is, the volume flow rate is the velocity times area, which is meters per second times meters squared, which gives you meters cubed per second or volume per second. If we multiply rho times B times A, then what we get is we get meters cubed per second times kilograms over meters cubed, and that is kilograms per second, which gives us the mass flow rate. So all you have to do is take your volume flow rate and multiply it by the density to get the mass flow rate. Um, sorry about that. I was being crazy. So those were the eight fluids questions. Um, going back before we talk about the two fluid problems from the practice finals, you need to know Bernoulli's equation and the continuity equation. And then you need to be able to write P1, P2, H1, H2, V1, V2, A1, A2. And that's usually the whole um, algorithm for solving anything to do with a changing cross-sectional area or even moving up and down in the air or down below the water because if there's no change in area, these terms go away and you get the pressure difference, which we did at the very beginning of fluids. Um, the other two things were, were Pascal's and then that the force of buoyancy is the mass of water to place times G and MA is F of buoyancy minus MG for an object. A is equal to zero if floating and um, density is mass over volume. So you can turn these into um, M is density times volume if you want. And that's it. That's everything there is really for fluids. Um, and if you can do these problems, these eight problems, you're going to be fine. In fact, you probably don't need to really worry about Pascal's. Um, the, the incompressible volume, uh, enclosed volume, all that good stuff. <clears throat> anyway, so I don't know which one of the two practice finals this was, but in this one, what we have um, is basically like a bubble in a sparkling water. So you have like a, a LaCroix water and you're looking at the bubbles in the water and they're floating to the top, okay? This bubble is going to be made of hydrogen and I give you the density of hydrogen and I tell you that the bubble is a perfect sphere with a radius of 0 0.002 meters and it has constant volume throughout this whole problem. So the bubble's not gonna get bigger. And the water has a density of a thousand and the density of air is 1.2. So what's gonna happen is we're gonna figure out the acceleration of this bubble in the water. And once it gets into the air, the acceleration it would have in the air if this bubble's hydrogen. So the first thing we want is the volume and mass of the hydrogen bubble. Now we know the density of 0.09 uh, kilogram meters cubed. 
and we know that volume is four thirds pi r cubed for a sphere. Um, r here is 0 0.0002. And it's a simple matter of plugging those numbers in to get the volume. Um, so that would be two times 10 to the nine. So eight times 10 to the nine, four thirds pi times eight times 10 to the minus nine um, meters cubed, whatever that happens to be. Um, I can do that really fast. That's 33.5 times 10 to the minus nine meters cubed. Now the density is mass over volume. So the mass is density times volume. And if we multiply this by 0.09, um, I get um, three times 10 to the negative one. Um, obviously. Um, okay. Do I? Yeah. So I have the mass and I have the volume. Um, so the mass is three times 10 to the negative nine. The volume is 33.5 times 10 to the minus nine meters cubed kilograms. As shown in the illustration, it begins at rest two meters below. So now we need H1 will be zero, H2 will be minus two meters. Um, the net force is not zero. So MA, remember there's a buoyant force and there's a weight. MA is FB minus MG, but the buoyant force is the mass of the water displaced times G, which is the density of water times the volume times G of the object. So this is density of water times volume times G minus the mass of the hydrogen bubble times G. Um, if we divide through by the mass of the hydrogen bubble, we get that A is equal to the density of water times the volume times G minus mass of hydrogen over G divided by MH. Um, when you do that, this is going to be about 9,800 times our volume, um, which is 3.23, 3.283 times 10 to the fourth, 10 to the minus four. Um, the mass times G is going to be about minus three times 10 to the minus eight. And then dividing by three times 10 to the minus nine, this is actually going to give me about, um, if I flip that up, I'm gonna get about 10 times, uh, 10 to the fifth. Sorry, my dogs are being annoyed. This answer is going to be about 10,000 meters per second, pretty fast um, as it shoots up. Um, if I did that right, I might have messed up. Um, girls, stop. Let me double check that really fast and make sure that I didn't completely mess that up. Um, so um, if we look at this, essentially I had you find the mass and the volume so that you could easily compute the acceleration. And the acceleration comes from MA is FB minus MG, where FB is the mass of, or the density of water times the volume displaced, which is the same as the volume of the object times G minus the mass of the object times G. If I divide that through by M, I get A and, um, I just want to double check that I didn't do something really stupid um, because I do have my solutions and you do too. They're up in Canvas. Um, I'm not sure if this is the right one that I will. Sorry, this is, I should have this open already. Wait. 
this is where I um, Oh, nope, this is the wrong one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I get 1.095 or 1.09 times 10 to the fifth meters per second squared is the acceleration. Um, so that's dumb of me. Uh, this is actually acceleration, which is pretty fast. Um, once the bubble emerges into the air, its acceleration changes. So again, the mass of hydrogen A is buoyant force minus mg of the hydrogen. But now the buoyant force is the density of air times the volume of the hydrogen minus mhg. If I divide that all by the mh again, I get A. And when I do that, because the density of air is only 1.2, this becomes 121 meters per second squared. So it rises pretty slowly in the air, basically because it's not as buoyant in air because the densities are almost the same. Um, not almost the same, I mean, it's a hundredth less than a similar air molecule, but um, it's pretty close when you compare the density of hydrogen to the density of water. So. Uh, that's the same exact equation. Now, assuming the acceleration in water and the acceleration in air are constant, what is the velocity when it reaches two meters in the air? Now, remember, it starts, so it goes from negative two to zero with an acceleration of 109000, one times 10 to the fifth meters per second squared. So, if we go back and we remember this equation, 2a um, y final minus y initial. Our y final is zero. Our y initial is negative two. Our v initial is zero. So v final is 2a times essentially um, y initial with a negative sign. Um, when we do that, we see that this ends up being two two times 10 nine, oh, 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 times two the square root of that. This ends up being 660 meters per second once it hits this, but then it's going to change and our Y initial will be zero and our Y final will be two and our A will now be 121 meters per second squared and our V initial will now be 660 meters per second. Same thing, V final squared is V initial squared plus 2A, Y final minus Y initial. Plugging all that in, take the square root, you get 660 times 660 plus two times 121 times two. Taking the square root of that answer and I don't get much of a change. I get about 660 meters per second, a little bit more, but essentially there's not much of a change over two meters, even with this much acceleration to the velocity of the hydrogen bubble. That's kind of weird. Um, basically whatever speed it emerges at, that's the speed it's gonna be going in the air, um, which is pretty neat. I don't know, I found it interesting. Now. The last part of this problem is, what if instead of hydrogen, we had argon and the density of argon, remember the density of our hydrogen was 0 0.09 kilograms per meter cubed. So we're gonna repeat everything with argon, which is 1.78, but there's one huge difference here. The density of air was only 1.2. Argon has a greater density than air, but less dense than water. And so what that means is that when it comes out of the water, it's going to be accelerating pretty close um, to what the hydrogen is. But as soon as it gets to the air, there's no buoyant force. Now the, the acceleration, the buoyant force is actually less than the weight of the argon. 
So what it's going to eventually end up doing is sitting on the surface. Um, and if you run the numbers, you'll find that for argon, A is still whatever it is. And then when it gets here, A is negative. So it doesn't rise in air because argon's heavier than air. It just sits at the surface. Um, yeah, so that's, I don't know. A, it's not a difficult mathematical question, but if you definitely don't know how to do it, um, you're, you're going to be in trouble. Um, so again, this just goes back to MA is the buoyant force minus MG, um, where M is the object and FB is the density of whatever you're in times the volume of the object times G. Um, and that's all there is really to this. The next one, or the last, the final question is really one of those ones that I just like to throw on a test to see what you guys think of things. And that says your sarcastic friend claims that they make an anti-gravity device, they fill a balloon with hydrogen and release it and it rises. What I wanna know is do you consider a balloon to be anti-gravity? I think I might've asked you guys this on a quiz, but um, when I ask you these questions, I want a few sentences. I wanna know what you're thinking. I wanna know what you learned, what your opinions on things are. Um, I find it strange. Density is a very weird thing because gravity attracts everything and yet a balloon rises in the air. And the reason why it rises is the density of the hydrogen is less than the density of the air. So it gets shuffled in a way because the air isn't rigid, it's fluid. It can shuffle itself around and it arranges itself so that the most dense stuff is closer to the source of gravity, if you will. Um, so it's not that the balloon is defying gravity, it's that the density of the object is shuffling around and the, the more dense stuff is attracted, so it moves closer because it can, because it's fluid. Um, there's a lot of things you could say. There's no right answer. There's definitely wrong answers. And if you give me a thoughtful answer on something like that, I'll give you full credit. If you give me the answer is they have different densities, as I say there, I want more than that. I just wanna know what you're thinking. I wanna, you know, give you a chance to think about and verbalize some of the ideas that we've talked about and give me your opinion on on what you would actually say. Um, but don't don't rack your brain. Just try to give me a good idea or two and I'll give you full credit. Okay. Um, the last fluid question we're going to do in the review is the heart. So your heart has um, and forgive me, biology people, has, you know, two arteries that go in and out. And then in your wrist, you have a much smaller vein or artery, uh, uh, the ulna, I know I put it on here somewhere, the ulnar artery in your wrist. Um, and so we're going to treat this as basically a hose that starts off at your heart and goes to your wrist. And it has a area one and an area two. And area two is much less than area one. Um, and we're gonna answer some questions about it. And we're told that the blood pressure in the human heart for systole is 16 times 10 to the third Pascals. Um, blood pressure isn't that simple because the heart pumps. It has different blood pressures at different times. We're going to assume it's a static constant blood pressure at the heart. Um, and that the velocity that it leaves at, uh, so let's back up for a minute. This is definitely a Pascal or a Bernoulli's equation problem, which means we write this and we remember that we also have our um, continuity equation, V1, A1 is equal to V2, A2. And so P1, P2, B1, B2, A1, A2, H1, H2. That's what you're gonna do for every part of this problem, basically. So we're asked, what is the velocity of the blood through the ulnar artery? 
And we're told that V1 at the heart is 0 0.3 meters per second. And that the cross-sectional area, A1, I can't read that on here. I think it's 10 to the minus five. 7.8 times 10 to the minus five meters cubed. And A2 at the wrist is 4.5 times 10 to the minus six. And so you can solve the continuity equation for V2 and get the velocity through the human wrist. Then assuming that, so now we know V1 and we know that V2 is V1 times A1 over A2. We'll assume that that's a number that we know. We know these. Um, this was 0 0.3. Pop! My dog. Um, and we know A1 and we know A2. So in this problem, we say that they hold their arm at the side and the wrist is 0.14 below their heart. So we'll say that H is 0 and this is negative 0 0.14 meters. Um, and that the density of blood is 1060 kilograms per meter cubed. So now all you have to do is, and we know that P1 was um, 1.6 times 10 to the third, so 1600 Pascals. Um, I'm sorry, that's 16,000 Pascals, 16 times 10 to the third. And then we just have to find P2. And all you have to do is plug in these values since you know them all now. Um, that's not too bad. Same thing here. Now they're holding it vertically over. So that would change this from negative to H1 is zero and H2 is positive 0.14. You'll actually get a decrease in static pressure when it's over your head, which will might throw you a little bit, but that's because it loses pressure to gravity. Um, static pressure and Gravitational pressure have to be constant, so uh, you lose some pressure, and the the kinetic pressure goes up because you're going through a wrist, which means more velocity, all that good stuff. The final question here is what is the volume flow rate? So you can use either v1 a1 or v2 a2, and this will give you meters cubed per um, second. Then it says, how fast would you bleed out if you had five liters of blood? And one liter of blood has one times 10 to the minus third meters cubed. So if at the heart it's 0.03 and A for the heart was 7.8 times 10 to the minus five, that is 0.3 times 7.8 is 2.3 four times 10 to the minus five meters cubed per second. Now, the volume divided by the volume flow rate will give you the time because this is meters cubed per second, this is meter cubed. So the volume is five times 0 0.005. So 0 0.005 divided by this answer times 10 to the fifth. Um, 2.34 times 10 to the minus five. But when we flip it, it becomes 10 to the fifth. This ends up being about 20 seconds. Um, sure. Sorry, 200 seconds, 213 seconds. Um, let me make sure that that was what I actually got. Um, and that I didn't make a huge mistake on that. Um, But 200 seconds is about three minutes. Um, and let me. Yeah, 213 seconds or about three and a half minutes. So 
those numbers were probably as close as I could actually find to the velocity of blood through the human heart. Um, it doesn't exactly work because as I said, it's a dynamic system and we're assuming it's a constant system and there's a lot of stuff going on, but it's something to remember that um, if you cut your arm, you don't have very long before you could lose all the blood in your body. So get a tourniquet on it if you're bleeding out. Um, but I wanna caution you to say, don't tourniquet anything because you lose limbs. Um, it'll save a life, but it usually ends up with a loss of limb, but definitely try to stop the bleeding if you can, because the human body, yeah, you can see from the numbers, doesn't take long to lose all its blood. Um, I know, a little macabre, sorry. Um, but anyway, so if you can do these eight homework problems and these two uh, practice finals, I think you're fine on fluids. I think you've, you've got fluids down, okay? Um, so moving on to our second um, part, which is the gravity stuff. I know I've already talked about gravity. I um, am going to just kind of quickly run back through the homework stuff, um, mostly just talking about the equations. Um, that we have. But as a quick overview, remember that we had from Kepler, his first law was that there are ellipses and that there, the sun is at one foci. Um, that meant that, and then two, it was equal area, equal time, which is also another way of saying, um, L conserved, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And then three was T squared is equal to four pi squared G over M times A cubed. We'll talk about that one too. But these lead from, um, so this is A and this is also A, and this distance here is EA, and this is perihelion or RP, and this distance, if there's nothing that this foci is RA for aphelion. And so we get RP plus RA is 2A. We also get that RP is A minus EA and RA is A plus EA. We get T squared is equal to A cubed sun, um, orbiting sun in solar system or T squared is four pi squared G over M A cubed um, mass other than sun. You have to use the whole full thing. Um, and we have one AU is 1.5 times 10 to the 11th meters. And we have G is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. Uh, with a whole bunch of crazy units that I'm not going to put on there. But L tells us that MVR at A is equal to MVP at... So the mass times the velocity times the radius is the angular momentum. And that gives us this nice equation that says the velocity at aphelion times the radius at aphelion is the velocity of perihelion times the radius of perihelion, or if B is R omega, you can do omega at A, R A squared is omega at P, R P squared. And we'll see that in one of the problems. Um, so that's Kepler's stuff. The other side of this is the force of gravity according to Newton is mass one times mass two over the radius between the two. And that we have a new energy equation that's potential energy plus kinetic where the potential energy is now g m m1 m2 over r plus m v squared over two but that's actually equal to g m1 m2 over 2r which means that the total energy at any time is really negative G M 
one M two over R. Um, and that's really important. Um, and we'll see those when we look at these problems. So what I would concentrate on is make sure you know how to do Kepler and you'll see that in the, um, um, the uh, problems, make sure you understand the force of gravity. Um, so we went over a lot of these. The sun and earth each get a gravitational force on the moon. Now, MA is equal to, we say it's G M1, M2. Remember that this is M1, R squared. But I want you to think about it this way, as M1 times G M2 over R squared, where R is the distance between. This is your acceleration. M2 is whatever M1 is orbiting. So if it's the Earth orbiting the sun, M1 is the Earth, M2 is the sun. If it's you and the force of gravity on you at the surface of the Earth, M2 is the Earth. It's always the object. We want the ratio for the gravitational force on the moon due to the sun over, so sun, moon, earth, moon. So this ratio is G mass of the sun over distance from sun to moon squared times mass of the moon over mass of the moon times G mass of the earth radius from earth to moon squared. The mass of the moon cancels, the G cancel, and what you're left with is mass of the sun over mass of the earth, radius from earth to the moon squared over radius from sun to moon squared. They tell you in here to take the sun to moon distance to be one AU and earth moon, I guess you just look up, um, which is kind of weird that they didn't just tell you what that was, but that's it. Um, this was just making sure you understand the force of gravity. This one says that you have a probe that's somewhere between the sun and, and earth. So this distance is earth to probe. This whole distance is radius uh, sun to earth, which is one AU. And this distance is sun to probe. We can see that REP um, so RSP is equal to one AU minus REP. Um, and then what we have is the force of gravity. Sun on the probe has to be equal to the force of gravity, earth on the probe. And so we get G mass of the probe, mass of the probe, mass of the sun, R S sun to probe squared. This is G mass of the earth, R earth to the probe squared. And that cancels, that cancels, that cancels, that cancels. We're trying to find how far from earth. So we get R E P squared times mass of the sun over one A U minus R earth probe squared. Um, let me actually, move the mass of the sun over. If I take the square root of both sides, this becomes, so forget this for a minute, this becomes the radius of the earth to the probe, one AU minus radius earth probe. You can easily solve this for REP, just multiply both sides by one AU minus REP, where one AU is, um, 1.5 times 10 to the 11th meters and solve it. Um, mass of the earth is usually given as 5.98 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. Mass of the sun is sometimes two times 10 to the 30th. If it's not, it's like 1.99 times 10 to the 30th. There may be a typo in your book. One of our editions had a typo that it it had like 1.99 times 10 to the 28th, which was really weird. But basically you just set these two forces of gravity equal. This is a weird Wiley problem where you had to somehow get the radius from the sun to the probe in terms of the radius from the earth to the probe. And that's how you would do it. I wouldn't do that to you guys. That's a little 
too difficult on an exam because if you can't do it, that just says you don't understand the math, but it has not a lot to do with physics. Um, here we have Frank Lloyd Wright builds a mile high um, building and we wanna know what is the difference in your acceleration at the top. So you need to know that here at the surface, you're at 6.38 times 10 to the six meters. And here you're at 6.38 times 10 to the six meters plus 1609 meters, which is one mile. So you're gonna have some small change. Um, and essentially what we wanna know is what is the force of gravity at the surface minus the force of gravity at the top. And so the force of gravity at the surface of the earth is your mass times the mass of the earth divided by the radius of the earth squared minus your mass times G times mass of the earth over the radius of the earth plus 1609 meters squared. Um, and they do this nice little thing where they tell you that the force of gravity on you at the surface is 651 newtons. So um, what that's telling you is that the force of gravity at the surface times the radius of the earth squared is equal to G, your mass and the mass of the earth. So that you have that term because G, G, your mass, mass of the earth times one over radius of the earth squared minus one over radius of the earth plus 1609 squared gives you delta G, if you will. That's just a pain, um, but again, it's really just understanding the gravity equation and how it works and how it alters, how it changes with height. Now, this problem um, is about energy. And you can tell because it talks about kinetic energy. And what we said was the kinetic energy initial plus the potential energy initial is equal to the kinetic energy final plus the potential energy final. Kinetic energy, when we're talking about gravity, is either mv squared over 2 or gmm over r. Potential energy is always negative GMM over R, always, okay. And the last thing that we have if we need it is the total energy at any time is negative GMM over 2R. And yes, it is negative if energy is conserved. So we are given the mass, um, let me call this mass one, mass two, mass one, mass two, mass one. So mass two is the mass of the planet. It's what is orbiting, um, what is being orbited around. We're also told that this is the mass of the probe, so that's our mass one. Um, and we're given the radius of the planet, um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So if the probe is initially launched with a kinetic energy of five times 10 to the seventh joules, what will a kinetic energy be when it ends up four times 10 to the six meters from the center. So what we do is we do E initial is equal to E final, or um, this might seem a little weird, but kinetic energy initial minus G M M over R initial is equal to kinetic energy final minus G M M over R final. We're told what this is. So kinetic energy final is Kinetic energy initial plus GMM over R final minus GMM over R initial. Plug in numbers. Kinetic energy initial was five times 10 to the seventh. Um, R final is four times 10 to the sixth. R initial is 3.2 times 10 to the sixth. G is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. M2, the big M here is the mass of the planet 5.3 times 10 to the 23rd times little m, which is 10. And you'll get the kinetic energy. Um, if the probe is to be 
launched so that it achieves a maximum distance of 8.0 from the center, what should the initial kinetic energy be? And again here, kinetic energy initial minus GMM over R initial is equal to kinetic energy final minus GMM R final. And we wanna know what this is. Now with gravity, when you launch something, it's assumed that when it's as far away as it can get, it has no kinetic energy. Um, so we want to know what our final will be. I'm sorry, we want to know what kinetic energy initial will be. So the kinetic energy initial will be G M M R initial minus G M M R final. They told us what our final was eight times 10 to the six. We know that the initial radius was 3.2 times 10 to the six. And we know what GMM is. Um, so here, this problem is a really simple problem, but making sure that you know the correct term for the potential energy and you see how to use it in an energy equa uh, equation when energy is conserved. The only other thing is it could ask the total energy at any time would be minus GMM over R uh, with a two. And that's equal to, at any time, mv squared over 2 minus gmm over r or um, gmm over 2r minus gmm over r because this is the potential energy. It's half of, or sorry, the kinetic energy is always half of the potential energy. Um, which is weird, but OK. All right. This problem was the one that um, I'm going to skip this one, but that I don't know why there's like a weird two floating around in Wiley's answer that I'm not sure of. Um, but again, this is a, another problem where now you have two of them. So you have the kinetic energy of number one initial plus the kinetic energy of number two initially, plus the potential energy of one initially, plus potential energy of two initially is equal to, you know, all this stuff. Initially, they're at rest, so they don't have anything. And so what you have is you have G M times M, so M squared over the distance between them initially with a minus sign. Um, and you have, that's not squared. Um, you have two of those. And that's going to be equal to um, the kinetic energy final uh, minus two times G M and M squared over R, um, where our final, but our final was half of our initial. This isn't too bad to do. Um, like I said, there is a weird two floating around, but basically you just do this with energy exactly like the last problem. And I don't want to talk too much more about that. This problem is really important. We have an asteroid that is at 1.98 AU or 1.98 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun. The mean distance is another way of saying A. Okay. And we want to know how many Earth years. So this equation, as we saw in our quiz, if we are going around the sun and if we are in earth years for t and a is in au then we just have to put t squared is equal to a cubed where t is earth years and a is au we can completely ignore this because the conversion so that this becomes um earth years squared over AU cubed, that conversion ends up being one, um, oddly enough. And so we're told what A is. So T is the square root of A cubed, but because T is asked for in earth years and A is already in AU, this is just 1.98 cubed. And you get about whatever that is, um, something, 2.78, let me run that really fast. Yeah, 
yeah, 2.8, um, 786 uh, Earth years. But the reason why I gave you this really simple problem, and this is really important, is if you are in Earth years and you are orbiting the sun and you are in AU, it reduces. If you're not, if you're talking about something going around this, the Earth, then M has to be the Earth. And therefore, A has to be in meters and T has to be in seconds. Um, it's a lot easier to use T squared is equal to A cubed than G and M and the 4 pi half or 4 pi squared. That's why I gave it to you. This um, problem is another Kepler one. I actually like this problem. The period is the difference in those years. So it's 1982 minus 669 or 13. 13 Earth years. We know the comet's going around the sun and we're told that E is 0 0.987. Um, we want to know the semi-major axis, so we want to know A. We're around the sun, so we can find A is the third root of the period squared or the third root of 13, 13 squared, which ends up being this big number because this will be in AU. So convert, convert, one AU um, and 1.5 times 10 to the 11th meters. So multiply your answer by 1.5 times 10 to the 11th. Um, and then it asks, what's the greatest distance from the sun? Well, RA is equal to A plus EA, and we have E, so this is really one plus E times A, which is um, 1.987 times our A value. Um, nothing hard about that. That question is pretty easy, actually. Um, here's another Kepler one. We're told that A is 1.31 times 10 to the 11th. We're told that E is 0 0.0395. But here's where things get tricky. So we know the sun is at one focus. And this distance between the two right? This distance is EA and this distance is EA. So how far from one focus to the other is it? It's 2 EA. And we know E and we know A. So we can just multiply that. Um, and then you can take that 2 EA and divide it by the solar radius and you get that. This problem is all about making sure you understood the geometry of the ellipse. That's it. Um, so hopefully, if you did it, you didn't overthink it, and spend a lot of time on it. Um, OK, so now this problem is a little trickier. You might start to think, oh, I have a satellite and it's rotating, so I can get uh, Kepler stuff. And no, you don't need Kepler stuff. What you need is energy, and um, you need the uh, period watch. Um, so the period we're told is 8.7 hours. So 8.7 hours, one hour is 60 minutes and one minute is 60 seconds. So you can turn that into seconds. I don't care what that is. But we're asked for the radius of its orbit. Now we know that T is equal to two pi R over B. It's in a circular orbit, okay? Um, we also know that the force of gravity is G M M over R squared. Um, and we want R. What we don't have is we do know that this is 651 Newton or 65.1 Newtons. And we do know the mass of the satellite, but we don't know the mass of the planet. Um, and we want R. So what we have here is we have that R is square root of G M M over the force of gravity. Now, um, what can we do there? Well, um, we know that um, G M M is equal to 65.1 r squared. So maybe I should do this. Actually, I shouldn't have done that yet. We know that GMM is 651. So um, 
and I don't think that's going to help me. I need to find GMM. Um, oh, I'm being dumb. Um, don't do that. T squared is equal to 4 pi squared G big M over R cubed, right? So R squared is equal to G M T squared over 4 pi squared. Um, and if we plug that in here um, with a R, so if we plug that in here, what we get is we get G big M little m over four pi R. Um, sorry, um, G big M T squared times four pi squared R. And therefore these cancel and we get the force of gravity times T squared divided by four pi squared is uh, and M is R, but we need to know, uh, we know mass, we know the period, we know the force of gravity, we know four pi R squared. So we have R, just to see that again. Force of gravity is G mass of the planet times mass of the satellite over R squared. And we also know that T squared is four pi squared G mass of the planet R cubed, or that T squared times G times mass of the planet over four pi squared um, times R is R squared. So I just moved everything over. Force of gravity is G mass of the planet mass over T squared G mass of the planet um, four pi squared R Mass of the planet cancels, G cancels, multiply through, and you get that R is T squared force of gravity over four pi squared mass of the satellite. Okay, so once we've done that, um, the kinetic energy of the satellite and what is the mass of the planet? So the kinetic energy is equal to G M M over two R. We know that G M M um, I'm trying to think if I wanted to do this. Um, yeah, the GMM is uh, FG R squared. So FG R squared over 2R is FG times R to the half. And that's the kinetic energy. Um, what is the mass of the planet? Well, once you know the, the R, you can get the mass of the planet because you know FG. So that one's not too hard. It's really just figuring out um, how to set it up, which is kind of a pain. Um, this is a Kepler one with some angular momentum stuff. So um, satellite, actually it's not um, Kepler really. Satellite, in elliptical orbit has a period of blah about a planet blah. At aphelion, they give you Ra and they give you omega A. Um, and they wanna know what is omega at perihelion. Now we know MVR is equal to MVP RP, or if V is R, o, R omega, then this is omega, um, a times Ra squared is omega P times Rp squared, where I canceled the Ms and I used V was R omega. That being true, we know that omega P is Ra squared over Rp squared omega A. Um, and we have to have an omega because that's what it's asking us for. Now, once we've done that, our problem is how do we find Ra? We know that T squared is four pi squared over G M A cubed. We know the mass of the planet. This is the mass of the planet, not the mass of the satellite. So you can find A from here. Once you have A, 
RA is A plus EA, um, and RP is A minus EA. How we would find, um, we don't actually need that, sorry. We need RA plus RP is equal to 2A. And from that, because we're given RA, we know that RP is 2A minus RA. Once we have A, it's easy to plug in there with that. We can get RA over RP. So this becomes um, RA is given 2A minus RA squared and then times omega A, which was given. Um, and you'll solve it. So there's a lot going on here. You had to know Kepler's third law to get A. In order to get RP, you had to know Kepler's first law, that they're ellipses. And therefore, on an ellipse, the distance from here to here is 2A. So this one from RA to RP, if the sun is at a focus here, this is A, this is A. So it's 2A from RA to RP um, in order to find RA. And then the last thing you had to know was L a is equal to LP, which means MBARA is equal to MBPRP, which means that omega A R A squared is equal to omega P R P squared. And you could use that to find omega P. It's a pain, but it shows that you understand Kepler's laws. Um, and then our final one before we get to the test questions, and we're almost done. Um, is a projectile fired vertically from the earth with an initial speed of 3.1, how far will it go? You might think I'm gonna use projectile motion. No, use energy. Um, so it's initially at R the earth and final is unknown. The energy here is G M M of the earth over R the earth plus, or I'm sorry, minus, um, plus G M, take that back, um, plus M V initial squared over two is equal to minus G M of earth M over um, R final plus M V final squared over two but we're assuming that when it gets at a further point, it's gonna be zero. This is actually the energy here. And we can cancel M for everything, knowing that 5.98 times 10 to the 24th kilograms is the mass of Earth. Um, what we get is our final is equal to negative G mass of Earth divided by negative G mass of Earth radius of earth plus V initial squared over two and pushing through the negative sign. What I get is I get G mass of earth over G mass of earth over radius of earth minus V naught squared over two. Not too bad. Um, remember that your V is in kilometers. So you need to put it into meters because G is in meters. Um, it would cancel on this term, but it won't cancel on the B term. So G needs to be, or B needs to be in meters. So that's 31,000, or I'm sorry, 3,100 meters per second. And that's it. Okay. <clears throat> we have two more to do. This problem is tricky because um, of what you're told. You're told this distance is 3.066 AU, but you're not told um, what this distance is. And it's not one AU. A of the earth is one AU, but this distance is actually RA of the earth, which is um, one, which is actually A plus EA. Um, Anyway, we'll get there. The asteroid has a period of 7.912 Earth years. 
So can we use t squared over a cubed or do we have to use t squared is for pi squared over gm um, a cubed? Well, t is in earth years already and we know we're orbiting the sun so we can use this. So a is third root of t squared or the third root of 7.912 um, and that will give it to you in AU, which is 7.912 times 7.912. And then third root on your calculator is usually under math. Um, this is 3.97 AU. Um, so the other thing that you could find though, is you could find the Earth's um, at AU. So the Earth's aphelion distance is one plus E of the Earth times A, where A is one AU, and E is 0 0.0167. So 1.0167 is 1.0167 is the Earth's um, aphelion distance. We were told um, that this is 3.066 AU um, beyond the Earth, and they're both at aphelion. So you could use either one. Um, I probably rounded something weird, or maybe I didn't, I don't know. But as long as this is close to four, we're fine. Um, secondly, once we have that, what's the aphelion distance of Earth? What is the aphelion distance of the asteroid? Um, so um, aphelion distance of Earth is one plus E times A, where A is one AU. Aphelion distance of the um, asteroid is A of the, uh, I'm sorry, is is for asteroid, this is for Earth, is RA of the Earth plus 3.066. Um, that is equal to, this becomes 1.0167. Um, and therefore, this is 1.0167 plus 3.066, which is 4.07082, I'll call it AU. What is the eccentricity of the asteroid? RA of the asteroid is um, A of the asteroid times 1 plus E, but we found A was 3.97. So this is 3.97, this is 4.082, this is one plus E, or um, 4.082, 3.97 um, is equal to E plus one, or 4.082 over 3.97 minus one is equal to E. What I get is I get 4.082 divided by 3.97, minus one, I get 0.028, really small, um, which is fine. It's basically in a circular orbit, um, like the Earth. The average angular velocity of the Earth is two times 10 to the seventh rad per second. Give the ratio of the average angular velocity to the average angular velocity, and then tell me what it is. Now, this is a really weird question that might stump you. But remember that the angular velocity is two pi over omega. The earth in one year goes around two pi radians. So omega is two pi rad over the period in seconds. Remember that one earth year is pi times 10 to the seven seconds. And what you get is that omega for the earth is two pi over pi times 10 to the seven, which is pi cancel, two times 10 to the minus seven rad per second. Now for the 
asteroid. So omega for the Earth over omega for the asteroid would be 2 pi over t, 2 pi over t, um, Earth and asteroid, the 2 pi cancel. This becomes t of the asteroid, t of the Earth, or this is t of the Earth over ta times omega of the Earth. But ta, we were told, was um, where did I have it? Oh, I never found it, did I? Oh, it's right here. 7.92912. Um, so TA is 7.912 Earth years. Um, that means that this is of the Earth over 7.912. And that, because the period of the Earth is one Earth year, that gives you 2 times 10 to the minus 7 divided by 7.912. It's annoying. It's actually not that bad, but it is annoying. Um, this problem is how far in radians will the asteroid travel um, before the asteroid will once again catch it? Now, um, what you need to realize is that in a time t, the Earth, well, the asteroid will travel delta theta over omega of the asteroid. So what's happening here is it's only gone some delta theta. When the Earth has gone all the way around, they both started here and the Earth, because it travels faster, has to go delta theta plus two pi rad. So this has to equal two pi plus delta theta over the Earth. And from that, you can find um, delta theta is, um, times, stop, omega of the Earth is equal to omega of the asteroid times 2 pi plus delta theta, and therefore delta theta times omega of the Earth minus omega of the asteroid is 2 pi omega of the asteroid, or delta theta is 2 pi omega A over omega Earth minus omega A. And you can find out how far that is. Once you do that, you can figure out how long because omega of the asteroid is delta theta over um, t, or t is delta theta over omega of the asteroid. Um, it turns out it ends up being like 14 months if you do it right. That question, just take a long look at it, um, see if you can figure it out. It's not too bad. Um, it's actually pretty simple. This question, the final question we're gonna to do today is about the moon and figuring out the moon's orbit from what we know. So we know that the moon has a period of 28 days, 2.4 times 10 to the six seconds or whatever that is. Um, we know that its mass is 0 0.012 masses of earth. Um, and we know the mass of Earth, I give you as six times 10 to the 24th kilograms. Um, and that the eccentricity is 0 0.055 for the moon. What is the semi-major axis of the moon? A. Um, so we're going around the Earth. So can we use T squared is A cubed? No, we need to use this with the mass of the Earth. So A is third root G mass of Earth T squared over four pi squared. Once you have A, what is RA? What is RP? RA is one, R, yeah, one plus E times A. RP is one minus E times A. Not too bad. Um, the total energy of the moon at aphelion, what is the total energy when it's at perihelion? And I wanted them in terms of 
symbols. So it's G M Earth M Moon over R A plus um, G M Earth M Moon over two R A and um, the same for RP, uh, which is RP instead. Considering conservation of angular momentum, give the tangential velocity of the moon at perihelion in terms of R and blah, blah, blah. Well, you know that VARA has to equal VPRP. Um, so VP is RP, um, VARA over RP. What is the average tangential velocity of the moon? Now, um, there's an easy way and a hard way. The easy way is actually, you know the period is two pi over omega. Um, and that is that omega is r, sorry, is a v. Omega is a v. So V is omega over A, which is two pi over T times A. That should give you the average velocity. The solution has the other hard way to do it. And then it says, if the moon's rest radius is 1.7 for any mass resting on the surface, what is the ratio of the force of gravity for the moon and the earth? Now, the force of gravity on the moon would be the object's mass times g mass of the moon over radius of the moon squared. The force of gravity due to the earth would be m times g times the mass of the earth over the radius from the earth to the moon squared. And if I take that ratio, these m's cancel, the g's cancel, and what I get is I get the mass of the moon over the mass of the earth times the radius of from the earth to the moon squared over the radius of the moon squared. And I think um, I think I wanted you to use A. So this became mass of the moon times A squared over mass of the earth times the radius of the moon. Now the moon we said was 0 0.012 moon earth or mass of earth's so this is 0 0.012 times a squared over this 7 times 10 to the 6 meters squared um i don't remember what a ended up being um, i could look it up i'm not going to you can see on oh, maybe it's right here Um, yeah, it ends up being um, 625 times. Um, so on the moon, the moon's gravity is 625 times greater than the Earth's gravity um, when you're on the moon. The gravity that's pulling you towards the Earth, it's 625 times stronger, um, which isn't too bad. Um, A ended up being um, 3.88 times 10 to the eighth meters, it looks like. Yeah. Um, so anyway, take a look through those. For gravity, really what you need to remember is the Kepler stuff, which gives you um, RP plus RA is 2A. RP is A plus RA minus EA. Um, A minus EA. RA is a plus EA. Um, 
MVARA is equal to MVPRP, and T squared is G here, is 4 pi, if it will actually work for me. Um, is 4 pi squared over gm a cubed. And if you're in our solar system, t squared is a cubed. If this is Earth years and this is a u. Um, energy, kinetic, potential. Kinetic is negative gmm over r. Um, sorry. Potential is GMM over R. Kinetic is positive GMM over 2R or MV squared over 2 minus GMM over R. Um, force of gravity is GMM over R squared. And that's really pretty much everything equation wise you need. I would really concentrate on the stuff using Kepler's laws and using the eccentricity to find the period or RP or RA, and not so much about the energy stuff. I mean, make sure you kind of know how to do it, but it's gonna be a small part. What's going to be more important is being able to use Kepler's laws to find things. Um, and make sure you know the fluid stuff. And then Thursday, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through um, pendulums, oscillations, and um, the cumulative stuff, just to make sure you remember how to do some stuff like projectile motion or a mass connected to a pulley on an incline with energy or with forces. Okay, um, that's all I got for you guys today. Uh, get your worksheet done. Um, and I appreciate you guys being here. Um, good luck on your finals this week and next week. Um, I'll talk to you in a couple of days. Uh, Tiffany. Uh, you still here, Tiffany?